Review copy provided by Atlas. And uh, don't worry, this won't stop me from being as detailed and level-handed as I possibly can be to give you an informed decision. Soul Hackers 2 is a new spin-off to release under the megalithic Megami Tensei umbrella, being a 15-year-old sequel to Devil Summoner, Soul Hackers. And don't worry, I'm not gonna just fluff this video out with a boring, overdone intro, because the baseline is, should you buy this game? And I really think, more so than recent releases SMT5 and Persona 5 Royal, that it could be a fairly complicated question depending on what you like in your games, RPGs, and in Megaton as a whole. This is a spoiler-free review. I will be showing out-of-context footage avoiding major scenes for the first 20 or so hours of Soul Hackers 2, what is reasonably and roughly a 50-hour game. If you are seeing this video briefly after it releases and have more questions afterward, I will be streaming Soul Hackers 2 every single day from start to finish on my Twitch, and at the time of writing this, I have not beaten Soul Hackers 2 in its entirety as to reserve that for Twitch. But I have spent enough time engaging with the battle systems, music, dungeon variety, and story enough to feel completely confident in giving you a verdict on whether or not this game is up your personal alley or not. So, here are my thoughts. I'll go into it more later, but to put it brief, Soul Hackers 2 is about separate groups of people trying to amass all of God's covenants to bring about the end of the world. Ion, an otherworldly AI, senses the destruction and creates two human vestiges to fit and restrict pieces of the AI into bodies made to ensure that this end of the world situation doesn't happen. The main AI, referred to as Flamma, creates Fig and Ringo, Ringo's name being a pun for Apple in Japanese. These two have personality traits that the other doesn't and act somewhat as foils for each other. Ringo is snarky, quick-witted, and throws herself into danger, while Fig is nurturing, cautious, and planning. It's sort of a big sister, little sister vibe in some regard. From here, you control Ringo as your spoken female protagonist, which is honestly a breath of fresh air and adds something unique to Soul Hackers 2 identity from the start. As you might be able to tell, the concept for starting Soul Hackers 2 is a lot more high concept and sci-fi than other recent entries like SMT5 and P5R, and in general is much more concerned with telling a specific story and narrative with specific characters. First thing many people are bound to notice about Soul Hackers 2 upon boot up is the sheer amount of texturing and particles at play, which are a huge bump from SMT5 and even Persona 5 Royal. It clearly uses a similar system to how Persona 5's models were made, but in an even fresher way than before. And the cutscenes feature dynamic angles, lens flares, and in general seem to be a lot more high quality, graphically speaking, than anything on display in the most recent Atlas games that have been put out, genuinely looking its best for a game with its aesthetics. This focus on varied facial animations, unique props, angles, and ample cutscenes gives every scene in Soul Hackers 2 a more cinematic quality than other Atlas titles. But what happens within these cutscenes? The writing of Soul Hackers 2 is going to be very hit and miss with people, depending on their tastes. Ringo, at her best, is hilarious and quick-witted, and her English VA is one of the best casting choices I could imagine for her character. However, this snarky personality sometimes feels as though she is commenting on a situation as if she was reacting to the game, rather than to a situation she's personally in, though. This can be somewhat explained by the fact that she's an AI coming to grips with her new human self, but the stakes are still extreme in this world, and so it comes off kind of odd, sometimes giving the game an immersion-breaking Marvel movie effect on her dialogue and lines, the sort of Marvel movie quippery that has been long built up and dunked on in recent times, with people making memes like, you tell me a gar licked this bread, and whoo, he sure looks like he's had a bad day. These sorts of lines are in the hundreds through Soul Hackers 2, and it really depends on what kind of experience and story you are looking for on whether these lines hit and have you enjoying the story all the way through, or have you cringing out of your seat and putting the game down. This is also contrasted pretty heavily with many other characters who have many emotional arcs and moments with little build-up, lots of yelling and emoting with not much context prior to them happening. And that's partially because we've clearly entered the story in the middle, so to speak, with all of them carrying some baggage that we come to understand as we get to know them through the game. Since most character growth is within these sort of cutscenes, within long dungeon crawling sections, I often didn't feel as invested in the first part as I could have. Another thing that helps and hurts this is the voice cast overall. As I mentioned, I think Ringo was handled fantastically, and a few others also stand out. In the running for second place is easily the VA for Sizel, 
Griffin Poitou, who some may recognize as Lewis from Beastars. He gives an absolutely spectacular performance and sounds just like the character looks to a T. Other characters, in my opinion, though, while being above standard for a dub, just sort of meet their role where it is. I feel this way about Melody, Fig, Arrow, who, while they fit the characters they are given, are sometimes disposed to give lines that feel a bit off or a bit out of character. And this could be the directing or the source material they were working with. It's not necessarily the VA's fault. It's well done, but not inspiring. Other characters that are more in the B role, like Ash, I felt gave a really good performance, but didn't have voices that suited the characters they were voicing. At the end of the day, though, overall, I think few, if any, people will have significant problems with the VA work on the Japanese and English side, both of which are available to be chosen from. From the writing, to the cutscenes, to the voice acting, the last element of the story segments that I feel the need to mention is the set design. Bar Hedron is an example of a beautiful little area, and every cutscene featuring characters talking at its bar look wonderful, but set quality is very inconsistent. When I first wandered into the orphanage in the game, I actually was stunned by how low quality the textures and modeling was, and how bland and unfinished the design looked overall. From the perfectly square block gravel paths and grass with no dimension to them, to the perfectly clean, bland orphanage houses, this was one of the worst looking sets in a recent Atlas game, giving the feeling that some areas didn't quite have enough time in the oven. Similarly, many scenes in dungeons are in vacant gray rooms with boxes and small rubbish randomly strewn about. This does affect the overall impression of many cutscenes, and the quality difference between sets is hard not to take notice of at times. But anyways, while this may be my spoiler-free opinion of the presentation of the story, I'd argue many people attest to play Atlas games for its engaging gameplay over all else. And so, let's get into that before we go any further. Soul Hackers 2 operates on the stack battle system, which operates differently from the recognizable press turn, one more, and baton pass systems, and at its most basic, operates like this. Every time you strike a weakness per person, you add a number to a stack. Once the player has exhausted all of the turn rotation, at the end of your turn, Ringo uses this stack as a multiplier for base damage additionally given out to all opposing enemies. In the early game, this feels a lot more like a traditional JRPG than most Atlas games, with less option for in-depth strategy than press turn baton passed and debatably less satisfying even than the One More system. However, after the second major dungeon, you start to be able to unlock moves and comp skills, which can add extra stacks to the bunch, such as character-specific affinities and moves. You might have a high MP cost move that also includes a random chance of adding extra numbers to the stack, or a set type of elemental attack for a specific character that will add twice as many stacks as you typically would get. So some depth to the system does reveal itself as you move onward, albeit a little late for my taste. Upgrades are also a crucial part of the process, with level ups for characters mainly being stat increases and level ups for demons operating as usual, with a few moves unlockable with levels until eventually they give you an item upon learning them all. Your actual upgrades are bought from the comp shop though, which you would still want to go back to as often as you can as the story progresses. By default, you have a list of demons at your disposal and choose to equip them as you seem fit with each demon summoner's abilities and affinities. But the comp shop allows for sometimes whole new ways to change the flow of combat, such as Ringo's crucially important skill of being able to change demons of herself and other party members during battle, being bought from the shop and upgradable rather than a default part of the system as the baseline unlocked skill only allows one demon swap per fight. All of these things slowly start to make the fights more engaging and strategic and help you break the monotony as the game goes on, but I do wish that some of this more nuanced aspect of the game was present from the start. The places you will be fighting is another point where it will be fairly hit or miss depending on what kind of player you personally are. The dungeons are about as classic PS2 era Atlas as you can get, which can be a pro or a con depending on who you are. All dungeons are essentially long labyrinthian tunnel mazes with copy-paste textures followed by specific rooms or set pieces. Occasionally, you will have to look for keys to unlock doors or solve incredibly basic puzzles that usually amount to you just being aware of the dungeon layout rather than any unique puzzle concepts. The dungeon layouts and even the way that you control Ringo then are very reminiscent of the random generation dungeons of Persona 4 with less visual and structural variety and the aesthetics of SMT3 Nocturne with lots of fat hallways and dead ends. 
I think for some, they will be very reminiscent of what people call the golden age of Atlas, which is when they put out countless smaller, unique spinoff titles on the PS2 era. This is just at home with, with one of those unique spinoffs. Other people, though, may just see this design as bland and dated. When not doing story dungeons, the first two of which essentially being the same looking underground train station, you also have an optional set of dungeons in the AI world of the Axis. These are all pretty identical blocky areas where you delve into one of each of the party members' pasts, getting more context on their stories and characters before you knew them, and also getting a chance to unlock skills for party members themselves for each major floor cleared. It's an interesting combination of Persona 5's metaverse with specific narrative context and individual party member growth. This also gives you the opportunity to unlock special fusions that would normally not be available if you hadn't delved that deep into their personal metaverses. Your ability to traverse farther also is soft capped by your relationship with each of the party members, which is a system I find very interesting. Something signified by a number that selectively goes up as you choose specific dialogue options from cutscenes in the main game. The more you show concern or take the side of certain characters, the more gates open up in their own mini metaverse to make further traversal possible. This means depending on how you play the game, let's say you're extremely passionate about one particular party member, you may be able to access areas with much higher level demons to you and better loot in the early game if you focus on that particular character more often. As you might have seen with the footage thus far, demon encounters operate the same way that you've come to expect from things like SMT4, although including a stun with the first hit and a battle engagement upon touching the character model to the overworld demon. There are also large purple encounters that are much tougher and can't be knocked down, and golden encounters which grant greater rewards but run away like golden hands. This for me is a great thing for Soul Hackers too, as it allows people to play and engage with as much or as little of the battles as they want. I barely ever felt like I was swapped with battles I didn't want, if ever at all, as any dialogue option, room change, item pickup, or anything else will stop aggro and despawn any chasing enemies. Honestly, for me, exploring dungeons in Soul Hackers 2 became something nice to do with my hands while I listened to videos and podcasts. Something unfortunately neutered in Soul Hackers 2, though, is demon negotiation. While unfair and basically random, mainline SMT has always had very personality-driven demons with lots of funny and unique dialogue. It was one of the best parts of SMT5 in my book. It always felt like a challenge to recruit them, and sometimes they would just rip you off and steal your money and leave. It gave this idea of demons as selfish creatures and you wanting to convince them to work alongside you without being taken advantage of. Especially with SMT4, I felt it sort of came into a flow state with balancing the yeses and noes, really trying to convince them to get the demons I want. Persona 5 also brought back demon encounters all the way back from Persona 2, which I think actually handles the demon negotiation the most smoothly. It deals with determining the moods of the demons and matching that with the archetype they played upon in order to convince them you are similar enough to them for them to want to join you. The demons of SMT and how you recruit them are sometimes frustrating, but overall super fun and iconic elements of this game. Funny and deep. In Soul Hackers 2, this has been stripped out almost entirely. Instead, you send out demons you already have to scout the level, and as you run through, you can go up and talk to them, where they will give you items, heal your party partially, or bring to you a demon who's considering joining. From there, the demon will ask you for money or health or an item of some sort, and you can choose whether you want to give it to them or not. If you choose yes, you give them the thing, they join you. If you choose no, they don't. I never, in my dozens, if not over a hundred times experiencing this, was ever ripped off, told no, or had to engage with them as if they were a real being. Much of the dialogue is often repeated often enough to recognize the same dialogue quickly. And while theoretically I could see some people who hated this more RNG mechanic enjoying the simpler, more streamlined version more, it feels to me like they gutted a large bit of the personality and world building from the game and made it into something I accept, like an item from a chest. There are still personality lines from the demons when they level up and such, but there's not nearly as much of a variety or uniqueness as any recent Atlas games by comparison. 
Something people may or may not like, once again, depending on what they want, is the gameplay variety of Soul Hackers 2. For fans of the PS2 era golden age of Atlas, rejoice, because Soul Hackers 2 is a straight-laced, consistent, and constant dungeon crawler JRPG, with small cuts for story cutscenes and upgrades. For fans of Persona's multitude of minigames and extra features, there is nothing of that sort to be found in this game. Any time that you aren't in a dungeon, you are either healing, buying items, engaging in cutscenes, or... Well, yeah, th that's, that's about it. There is a point in the third major dungeon where you do have the option to control Fig's little robot, which is a cool novelty in the air ducts to get an item. But this is even more linear and dungeon crawly than you were already doing. On a gameplay basis, this essentially only changes things to have no camera control, and from you being able to choose your encounters to now having random encounter battles. Well, a fun novelty, I hesitate to call it variety still though, even if aesthetically things are changing, as it essentially is an even more bare-bones version of the gameplay that you've already been doing for the rest of the game's runtime. If you're itching bad for a straightforward JRPG with SMT demons and dungeon crawling, this is your dream come true. If not, you may find yourself putting on videos on the second monitor in order to keep your attention. Game balance of Soul Hackers 2 was really interesting to me, as I felt the game generally did provide a consistent challenge. This also came with me being somewhat underleveled through the run, though. I played on normal difficulty, and it was a similar level of challenge that you could expect from something like SMT5, maybe erring a bit on the easier side. Still, any random encounter could be fatal if you were unprepared, and an ambush of larger groups of enemies could take you down before you get a turn classic SMT. Maybe I'm just used to the difficulty at this point, but it felt fairly inoffensive in regards to its difficulty, with most major bosses generally taking just a little beyond the first or second try to get right as I learned their resistances and weaknesses. I felt for the amount of battles I did though, it was weird that basically every level I went into I was underleveled. Something driven home by the demon negotiation I mentioned earlier, mostly ending with them giving me an item as they realized my level was too low to join, despite me still handily dealing with the situation the game was presenting me. One of the best and most fun things about Soul Hackers 2 is the encounter with Devil Summoners, something fairly rare in overall Megaten. Having people you face against who summon other multiple demons throughout a fight is a really fun twist on the standard demon fight and mechanically operates much more like SMT's Shiva fight rather than Grim Hala or plenty of others from SMT3, which I can only see as an improvement for people who enjoy genuine strategy in their games. Unfortunately, again, I think the shortcomings of the stack system do dampen some of these overall strategic opportunities from something more akin to the press turn or baton pass system, but the Devil Summoner fights themselves were still some of my favorite fights in the game. One thing with repeated battles and some of these unique animations though, to my knowledge and what I was able to figure out, these are unskippable by default, which sometimes causes battles to go longer than they should have otherwise, which is something they already fixed perfectly in SMT5, which allowed you to just hit a button to skip the animation. Game balance is a whole different story though if you have the DLC. It's always good to give people a chance to play games how best suits their style, but the demons above level cap given out for free and the insane frequency of experience grimoire items makes beating Soul Hackers 2 so trivial the average 10 year old could beat it if they had the DLC engaged. Assuming they didn't get bored from how little challenge there was and were actually able to deal with the monotony and play to the end. I can see that if someone just likes the power fantasy of being ultra tough and throwing out big numbers, or maybe just only cares about experiencing the story, that this could be positive for them, but considering it is paid DLC, it feels more like an integrated pay to win mode that undermines much of the point of playing the game in the first place. At least I imagine for most people. Nearly immediately, you can summon level 90 Satan with no material cost and brute strength your way through the entire game. Something similar was present in Persona 5 Royal's inclusion of the P5 DLC, but while it essentially is an optional thing to take or leave for personal players, I don't like the precedent it sets for future games. The inclusion of Day 1 story content also locked behind DLC in the Lost Numbers DLC rubs me the wrong way as well, as I think many, if not most, other people who've talked about this also agree. Let's talk about some more particular things that Soul Hackers 2 did well, though. For one thing, the aesthetic feels wholly unique and combines seemingly opposite elements surprisingly well, combining a clean, futuristic sci-fi with a corporate, dingy, controlled cyberpunk, and then mixing in homey acoustic vibes and carnival aesthetics in the bunch. 
It's something I personally never have seen, and while some people will immediately either fall into or out of love with this direction, I found that when I was really immersed into the direction of the game and how it was taking, the vibe was kind of immaculate. The slow, prodding piano carnival-like tunes at the end of battles, the spacey sci-fi areas, it's all mixed surprisingly well. The music specifically of Soul Hackers 2 as far as aesthetics go, though, is a bit of a mess overall. It doesn't quite come together under a unified idea or concept, with so much variety that sometimes the switch in tracks through scenes would feel like they were made for completely different games. There are classic hard rock battle anthems, dubstep and house music tracks, carnival-like swing music, and soft generic visual novel-esque music all mixed together. I wouldn't say I particularly disliked any of the tracks, although some of them did start to wear on me as I went through more and more dungeons and heard them over and over again. And I found a few of the tracks really catchy even, but it didn't give me the prestige and consistency of some of the great soundtracks to come out before it. In my view, being considerably weaker of a soundtrack than SMT4, 5, every Persona game, and version of every Persona game, and well, yeah, yeah. On the bright side, Atlas is known for its iconic, industry-defining, amazing soundtracks through and through, so not reaching that level for most companies is the expected. For many games, I would consider this serviceable, if not above average, as a soundtrack, but I couldn't help to feel that they missed their own bar by a noticeable amount. Now I'm going to go into some mid-game conceptual spoilers. I'll provide a timestamp to skip if you do not want to hear, but I am not spoiling anything to do with the events of the story, more so the lore for how the world works, and things I found interesting, which some Atlas fans may also find interesting like I did. Now, essentially there are two concepts I feel like Soul Hackers 2 explores with its world that I enjoy on a mythological and also meta basis. The first is how the public subconscious in Soul Hackers is equivalent to a sentient otherworldly AI that amasses all information, and in order to create two human limited vehicles for itself from this great amount of knowledge, it requires them to be given an ego to become fully human. This is actually weirdly consistent with other Megaton games in terms of what regards a human being, as this is the same way that Teddy becomes human in Persona 4. Spoilers, I guess, for 10-year-old Atlas game that is spoiled in nearly all of its promotional art, but Teddy was a shadow, living in the world of the public subconscious, but after building an ego, requires the aspects of the human psyche to wield a persona, allowing him to build a literal physical human body. Playing Soul Hackers 2, I found it really cool how they reused this concept, albeit with a different aesthetic skin for its explanation. Another thing in the mid-game is the concept and origin of covenants. You might think of the Ark of the Covenant of the Bible, which I believe is its obvious intention. From here, it also cites the classic Christian idea of imago dei, or that we are created in God's image and uses this to justify the concept of xenons or human-made demons. If we are made in God's image, Soul Hackers 2 argues, then humans are also able to create lesser beings than themselves as God is. I found this to be a super enthralling concept as I was playing, but alright, how did the game play? Well, I played on version 1.01 pre-release of Soul Hackers 2 on my PC using a PlayStation 4 controller. Strangely, I couldn't get my PS5 controller to work, but this is how I experienced it. For nerds out there who know more than I do, the listed minimum and recommended system requirements for Soul Hackers 2 are this, as listed on the Steam page. I ran them on my HP Omen with an Intel i9-9900K and 3.6GHz processor, 32GB of RAM, 1TB SSD, and NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 Super graphics card, and <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't run into any lag or really any issues at all. I also, and I was somewhat surprised, didn't run into any bugs at all either when I played the game, and the PS4 controller worked fine. I will say controlling Ringo's base movement sometimes felt slippery, with slow startup at full speed and continuing to move long after I stopped touching the control stick. She was able to snap and move quickly whenever she had the built-up momentum, but again, it felt like she was sort of walking on ice the entire time I played. I don't know if this was intended or not, if it was some sort of issue with my version, or if it was supposed to be like that. I don't think it was a problem and it wasn't irritating to use, but I do prefer to have Titan-specific controls over these more floaty ones. So, how does it compare to other major Atlas titles? I've referenced a few to hopefully give people better context as they've gone through this video. 
In regards to characters, world, and story, it far underperforms Persona 5, and I would have a hard time hearing someone make a genuine argument otherwise. And in terms of gameplay, it doesn't feel nearly as engaging as P5R and especially SMT5. In a lot of ways, I feel like I could see someone arguing Soul Hackers 2 is in fact a better game than SMT5, and in a lot of ways it does exceed it if in nothing else than its polish and cutscenes and story. It feels like a polished product, even if certain unfinished aspects show their head a few major times. For me personally though, I would say I enjoyed Soul Hackers 2 the least of these three games. As a standalone game though, I am glad to have played Soul Hackers 2. It provides plenty of interesting ideas and choices to keep me engaged, and was a very unique experience from what I've come to expect. I'm sure that there will be people who will get something out of this that they didn't from SMT5 and P5R, and whether you're that person or not is up for you to decide. So, should you play Soul Hackers 2? I hope that you have your own conclusion in mind based on your own preferences and the differences that I have mentioned. There are plenty of things that will cause hard left and hard right turns toward or against Soul Hackers 2 based on your preferences. Maybe the choices consistently go one way, maybe they are more mixed, but I hope that I've done my duty in giving you an informed look at the aspects of Soul Hackers 2 that will make a purchase a more confident decision for you. Also, I'm live right now, playing Soul Hackers 2 on my Twitch, and I will be live every day at 3pm CST for the coming days until I play start to finish. I hope you'll join me to hang out, to ask further questions, or just to feel better about your purchasing decision if you're still uncertain. Most of my money comes from Twitch donations and Patreon support, so please consider donating. I am entirely independent and living on my own. And I'll see you next week with my one hour long kanji analysis. See you soon. Thank you.